Let's get started on another week of our four and a half year verse by verse journey through all of God's inspired word. We are looking at events between the Old and New Testaments of our Bibles. A time sometimes referred to as the silent years, even though it's not silent with history, it's just silent from inspired history uh, reporting on the events themselves. We actually do have passages in the book of Daniel that predicted the things that we've been talking about. The progression of different rulers and kingdoms, uh, such as moving from the Persians to the Greeks under Alexander the Great. The breakup into the four different Greek Macedonian kingdoms of the Mediterranean Basin and how two of those kingdoms were going to bracket the Holy Land and uh, the power play back and forth between them. And we've been reading in the history books about those events. The big event that we've come to now is the one regarding a great crisis in the 2nd century B.C. And Daniel writes about it in this fashion in Daniel chapter 8, verse number 9. says, Out of one of them, that is, out of one of these horns that represented the Greek kingdoms, there came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land, which would be Israel. It grew great even to the host of heaven, and some of the host and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. So that's Antiochus IV, who styled himself on his coinage, by the way, as Antiochus the illustrious one, the brilliant one. And that's a play on both shininess and smartness. He thought of himself as being God-like. And it says in verse 11 of Daniel 8, It became great, even as great as the prince of the host. And the regular burnt offering was taken away from him, and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. And that's a reference to how Antiochus actually challenges God himself and uh, takes on the Jewish faith and shuts down things at the temple. And all of that is going to take place in our story today in the year 167 B.C. Now, last session, we were talking about how the Jewish faith was in crisis already when Antiochus came to power. Uh, There were Jewish people that had tired of their difference from the peoples of the world. And they wanted to be much more Greek-like. It was so strong that once Antiochus came to power, a man in the high priest family uh, went to Antiochus and bribed him to make him the high priest with promises of Hellenizing, that is, making more Greek-like, the entire nation. And this guy that we've known as by his, his uh, Greek name, Jason, uh, he built a gymnasium in the area next to the temple. And uh, the Jewish uh, priests and Levites, many of them, along with the younger people, became so enamored with the events in the gymnasium that they abandoned the things that were going on in the temple. And then a couple of years later, a few years later, uh, another high priest uh, wannabe, uh, he bribes even more uh, into the court of Antiochus IV, and he continues this, this effort of uh, Hellenizing uh, the Jewish people. And then uh, when Antiochus can't quite get Egypt absorbed into his kingdom and he runs up against his uh, nemesis, uh, the Roman Senate, 
um, there's turmoil at the city of Jerusalem, and he puts it down hard, causing the deaths of multiple tens of thousands of Jewish people. And then in the following year, right around Pentecost, which is the harvest festival that kind of closes up the spring and kicks off the summer, he sends a man, uh, Apollonius, to, uh, to kill off even more of the adult men that are religious in Jerusalem and in Judea, and to capture and turn into slaves a bunch of the religious women and their kids. And I'm pointing the fact that he's doing this to the religious Jews, the ones that were serious, because the Jews that are wanting to Hellenize are all on board with his plan, and he's good friends with them. And so he's not killing them off. He's killing off the Jewish faith, or attempting to, just as it described in the book of Daniel. And so somewhere right around uh, the first day of the eighth Jewish month, and so we're talking about October, it's now in the fall, it would appear that the king declares the Jewish faith completely illegal. And that everyone uh, that is a uh, believer in that faith is going to become a criminal. And uh, we read uh, some of this in 1 Maccabees chapter 1, verse 41 and following. It says, Then the king wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people, and that all should give up their particular customs, so basically outlawing anything other than Greek religion. All the Gentiles accepted the command of the king. Many, even from Israel, gladly adopted his religion. They sacrificed to the idols and profaned the Sabbath. So that's exactly what we need to understand. This is a great crisis for the Jewish faith. It was predicted long before in the book of Daniel. Uh, verse back in Daniel chapter 8, uh, it says that um, uh, verse, number third, uh, verse number 12, a host will be given over to it together with the regular burnt offering because of the transgression. It will be thrown truth to the ground and it will act and prosper. And then I hold, heard a holy one speaking and another holy one said to the one who spoke, how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? So the question is, how long will Judaism be completely outlawed? How, how long will the damage be done? Uh, and uh, he said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings. Now, that's a reference to the Jewish sacrificial system. One sacrifice mid-morning, one sacrifice mid-afternoon, so the evening and the morning sacrifices. So you divide this by two to understand the passage of time. Uh, and so we end up with 1,150 days. And we know, that this is kind of a spoiler alert here, we already know when Judaism's religious practices of the daily sacrifices was re-initiated by Judas Maccabee. We know the exact date on it. And so when you backtrack from that date, 1,150 days, it brings you to the first day of the eighth month of the Jewish year in 167. So that's why I suggest to you that that's probably when this official decree was put in place. And very aggressive, aggressive actions were starting to be taken against any Jew that was still trying to be religiously Jewish. Uh, let me go back to our first Maccabees 1 passage and continue. The king sent letters by messengers to Jerusalem and the towns of Judah. He directed them to follow customs strange to the land, 
to forbid burnt offerings and sacrifices and drink offerings in the sanctuary. So that's probably starting on the first day of the eighth month. Uh, And to profane Sabbaths and festivals. So they're not allowed to keep Sabbath days anymore. They're not allowed to keep Jewish festivals anymore. Uh, And to defile the sanctuary and the priests to build altars and and sacred precincts and shrines for idols, to sacrifice swine and other unclean animals, and to leave their sons uncircumcised. Now, we're going to come to how they defiled the sanctuary very specifically to make it unusable for proper Jewish worship. Uh, We'll come to that in just a little bit. Uh, But this idea also that they were setting up Greek worship sites everywhere else, and they're going to enforce Greek-style worship. And uh, many of the Jews will go along with that with no problem, because as I said, many of them already have tired of the idea of their unique Jewish faith. Uh, They're abandoning God. Uh, But they also were told that they had to no longer circumcise their baby boys on the eighth day. Uh, They were to make themselves abominable by everything unclean and profane so that they would forget the law and change all the ordinances. He, and the he here is Antiochus IV, added, Whoever does not obey the command of the king shall die. In such words he wrote to the whole kingdom. He appointed inspectors over all the people and commanded the towns of Judah to offer sacrifice town by town. Many of the people, everyone who forsook the law, law, joined them, and they did evil in the land, and they drove Israel into hiding in every place of refuge they had. And so this was the situation in the fall of 167 BC. The Jewish faith has been completely uh, declared illegal, and the Greek faith in multiple gods and their worship style has now become the the religion of the land of Israel. And unfortunately, many renegade Jewish people have joined in voluntarily to do that. And enforcement squads are being sent around the land to make sure these laws are followed. And so now we read in 2 Maccabees, Chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Not long after this, and that means after the Pentecost massacre and then after the declaration that Judaism is illegal, this is what happened. The king sent an Antiochian senator, so a member of the council in Antioch, Syria. So one of his government people to compel the Jews to forsake the laws of their ancestors and no longer to live by the laws of God. So this is the chief enforcer sent by Antioch, uh, sent from Antioch by Antiochus IV. And he also was to do this, also to pollute the temple in Jerusalem and to call it the temple of Olympian Zeus and to call the one in Gerizim, uh, that's the mountain up in Samaria, on which the Samaritan temple is located, the temple of Zeus, the friend of strangers, as did the people who lived in that place. So he is requiring not just the Jews, but also the Samaritans to abandon their uniquely Jewish-slash-Samaritan faith and to embrace instead the Greek religion of Zeus and his pantheon of gods and goddesses. And so both temples have now been dedicated to Zeus. And this is how the temple at Jerusalem was specifically dedicated to Zeus. Uh, This is from uh, 1 Maccabees chapter 1, starting at verse 54. Now, on the 15th day of Kislu, uh, that's, uh, the, that's the Jewish month uh, by that name, 
uh, and it's the ninth Jewish month. On the 15th day of Kislu, which in this year, by the way, that would have fallen uh, at the beginning of December of 167. Uh, In the 145th year, that's from the Seleucid calendar, their reckoning, they erected a desolating sacrilege on the altar of burnt offering. So what happens is uh, they take over the temple, of Jerusalem, and they rebuild a Greek-style altar on top of the Jewish altar in the courtyard in front of God's temple. And so not only have they said, okay, this is now the temple of Zeus, it is now the altar of Zeus. And then they dedicate that altar 10 days later. Uh, now, the, the uh, story tells a little bit more. It says, They also built altars in the surrounding towns of Judah, offered incense at the doors of the houses and in the streets. Uh, the books of the law that they found, they tore to pieces and burned with fire. Since the Jewish faith is illegal, the Jewish holy books are illegal as well. So anything they can lay their hands on, those are torn up and burned. Uh, And then anyone found possessing the book of the covenant or anyone who adhered to the law was condemned to death by decree of the king. And they kept using violence against Israel, against those who were found month after month in the towns. So again, that's another description of this reign of terror against the Jewish faith in Judea and Jerusalem itself. Now, back to the dedication ceremonies at the temple. On the 25th day of the month, so 10 days after they rededicated the altar in a Greek style, on the 25th day of the month, they offered sacrifice on the altar that was on top of the burnt offering. And so this is what's referred to as the abomination of desolation. It was predicted a couple of times in the book of Daniel. And uh, I'm going to read to you specifically from Daniel chapter 12, uh, verse number 11. From the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Now, that is our other timer about these events. Uh, The one in chapter 8 that I read to you is from apparently the day that the decree made Judaism illegal. This one in Daniel chapter 12 verse 11 is from the day that the abomination of desolation was set up on the 25th day of the ninth Jewish month, otherwise by our style calendar, the 17th day of December 167 BC. Exactly 1,291 days later, Judas Maccabee reinitiated the Jewish faith with Jewish proper sacrifices on a rededicated uh, altar. And uh, we will focus on that event uh, better tomorrow. Let me continue reading, though, uh, about the continuation of this crisis. It says, According to the decree, they put to death the women who had their children circumcised, and their families, and those who circumcised them, and they hung the infants from their mother's necks. So basically, anyone that's acting in a Jewish fashion is executed horribly, and uh, the, the, the crime is highlighted. Uh, by the way they display the body, such as taking the circumcised baby that's now dead and hanging it around the neck of the woman who bore the baby and circumcised it uh, and is now dead too. And then any of the family members, any priest that was involved in it, they're all dead. Continuing uh, with uh, a mention in Second Maccabees 6, verse 3, Harsh and utterly grievous was the onslaught of evil. 
For the temple was filled with debauchery and revelings by the Gentiles who dallied with prostitutes and had intercourse with women within the sacred precincts and beside brought in things they sacrifice uh, that were unfit. The altar was covered with abominable offerings that were forbidden by the Jews. People could neither keep the Sabbath nor observe the festivals of their ancestors, nor so much as confess themselves as to be Jews. So the temple complex, starting in December, is turned into a Greek worship site, including all the whole having sex with uh, uh, the... uh, the men or the women representing the god or the goddess that you're sacrificing to, so they're prostitutes in effect. Uh, And all that's happening in the temple complex. And um, Jewish people, nowhere near that building and that complex. They've been run away, uh, been killed. Uh, They're hiding out the ones that have not been tracked down. At this point, I want to read to you the special note from the author of 2 Maccabees. I've told you that uh, the writer of 2 Maccabees is particularly focused on the religious aspects. It says, Now I urge those who read this book not to be depressed by such calamities, but to recognize that these punishments were designed not to destroy, but to discipline our people. In fact, it is a sign of great kindness not to let the impious alone for long, but to punish them immediately. For in the case of other nations, the Lord waits patiently to punish them until they've reached the full measure of their sins. But he does not deal in this way with us, in order that we may not take, he may not take vengeance on us afterward when our sins have reached their height. Therefore, he never withdraws his mercy from us. Although the disciplines, uh, he disciplines us with calamities, he does not forsake his own people, Let what we've said serve as a reminder. We must go on briefly with that story. So the author of Maccabees, even though it's not an inspired book, is focused very much upon the religious aspects of it. Uh, The fact that God is judging his people's sin. Because as we've seen very clearly, this is a time of great sin amongst the Jewish people. They were, in large numbers, abandoning the faith and joining in willingly in Greek-style worship uh, and Greek-style uh, living and culture. And so that is the situation that stands uh, as we go into the winter of 167-166 uh, B.C., And during that winter, we meet our heroes of this time period, people that were predicted to arise in the book of Daniel. Uh, Now, we've already heard that there are enforcement squads being sent out all over the place to uh, make people demonstrate that they're no longer religious Jews, but rather uh, Greek uh, worshipers. And uh, some of the people that had been serving in the temple uh, were priests uh, from a town called Modain, which is a city about 15 miles northwest of Jerusalem. And so after the temple had been desecrated in the way it was, these guys retreat to their hometown, and then the enforcement squads arrive. This is from 1 Maccabees 2. In those days, Matthias, or Matathias, son of John, son of Simeon, a priest of the family of Yorib, moved from Jerusalem and settled in Modain. He had five sons, John, Simeon, Judas, who's going to be called Maccabee, Eleazar, and Jonathan. He saw the blasphemies being committed in Judah and Jerusalem and said, Alas! Why was I born to see this, the ruin of my people, the ruin of the holy city, and to live there when it was given over to the enemy, the sanctuary given over to aliens? Her temple has become like a person without honor. Her glorious vessels have been carried into exile. Her infants have been killed in her streets, her youth by the swords of the foe. 
What nation has not inherited her palaces and has not seized her spoils? All her adornment has been taken away. No longer free, she's become a slave. And see, our holy place, our beauty and our glory has been laid waste. The Gentiles have profaned them. Why should we live any longer? And then Mattathias and his sons tore their clothes. They put on sackcloth. They mourned greatly. And so that is the grief that uh, is happening in the winter of 167-166 at Modain. Uh, by Mattathias, a priest, and his family. Then, the king's officers who were enforcing the apostasy came to the town of Modain to make them offer sacrifice. Many from Israel came to them, and Mattathias and his sons were assembled. And so this is the procedure they followed. They'd come to town, build this little altar, and then require everybody from the oldest to the youngest, evidently, the most powerful uh, politically to the uh, least powerful, uh, to offer sacrifices and prove they had abandoned the Jewish faith. The king's officers spoke to Mattathias as follows. You are a leader, honored and great in the city, and supported by sons and brothers. Now, be the first to come and do what the king commands, as all the Gentiles and the people of Judah that are left in Jerusalem have done, then you and your sons will be numbered among the friends of the king, and you and your sons will be honored with silver and gold and many gifts. And Mattathias answered and said in a loud voice, Even if all the nations that live under the rule of the king obey him and have chosen to obey his commands, every one of them abandoning the religion of their ancestors, I and my sons and my brothers will continue to live by the covenant of our ancestors. Far be it from us to desert the law and the ordinances. We will not obey the king's word by turning aside from our religion to the right hand or to the left. You gotta love Mattathias. Come back tomorrow for more.